Okay, I think I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Brooke Pullman, and I'm an occupational therapist. I work at the University of Utah, um, both at the main campus and then um, most of the time at the Sugar House um, Clinic. I don't know if you know what occupational therapy is, but um, basically, if you listen to the keynote speaker this morning, Natalie, after she had suffered her injuries, I spent 10 years being a therapist, just like you saw in her videos. So um, I uh, did that full time at the hospital, um, working with neurologic um, adults mostly, um, who had suffered brain injuries, stroke, uh, spinal cord injuries, and amputations, so mainly. Um, so by uh, definition of an occupational therapist, my job is to help people get back to basically the job of living. Um, it's not, I, I don't help people get jobs, but I, um, uh, in Natalie's case, would be teaching her how to take care of herself again um, to start with, and then start learning how to do other tasks in her life. Um, and then eventually uh, she'd go to outpatient, which is where I work now, and um, be progressing in her skills and abilities, learning to live on her own at home, maybe cooking or grocery shopping or being in the community. Um, and then that oftentimes lead to, leads to driving. So um, that's kind of, um, I did that for 10 years and then um, had twins and went part-time and um, got involved with driving um, and thought it was kind of an interest, it's an interesting little niche of uh, occupational therapy. Um, but basically because of my um, education and helping people recover from physical disabilities, visual disabilities, cognition, um, that helps us be hopefully good evaluators on um, patient, a patient's ability to drive. And so um, taking that skill set and applying it to driving, now I'm seeing like a lot of, uh, like you guys do, um, a lot of children, pediatrics, I, I guess I would say. Um, so kids uh, in the age group ready to drive and mostly kids with disabilities. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, just by a show of hand, have any of you taught or have um, in your class that you know coming up, a child with a disability that you know of? Oh, good. Okay, good. So we have lots of experience to glean on. Um, so today we're going to um, talk about what I do um, and hopefully how I can help you. So basically at our program, um, I do, most of the time I'm going to be talking about these driving evaluations. Um, I also do driving training, driving practice, especially when we modify vehicles. And then um, driving re rehabilitation was kind of like what I was talking about with Natalie, you know, eventually teaching our current patients in therapy how to drive again. Um, we also have a wellness driving program where patients can come and use our driving simulator and um, practice on their own with a caregiver. So um, that's kind of what we offer at our uh, driving rehab program. Um, and I say program, it's, it's me. I'm the only one that does it. So um, we also, um, but we're trying, trying to work a little bit more hopefully with you guys and um, help you in uh, not only maybe assessing your client or maybe sending them to me to be assessed, um, but I keep saying client, sorry, student. Um, anyway, so basically what a driving evaluation, it's, it's a two hour appointment. It's $200 cash pay. That's probably the biggest uh, deterrent, um, which is understandable. But luckily uh, for your students, uh, your schools or districts will cover the cost. And so if you um, need that referral to have them see me, um, the district and school will cover it. Um, my job, again, is to assess their skills and abilities related to driving. Um, I have two hours, and so I can't see it all, right? And a lot of our drivers, a lot of drivers that come to me um, aren't drivers yet. They're, they're 15, they're 16, they have a disability, and most of the time the parents or the instructor is wondering um, if, they can, if they're a candidate for driving. So um, with that, I um, spend some time doing a clinical assessment and then a behind-the-wheel assessment. Um, on, with the clinical assessment, really, um, I start off just, you know, asking the, the patient and the um, parent, you know, what's the situation? Where are they at with driving? Um, has a parent already taught a, another child to drive? Because that's usually helpful, as you probably know, um, especially teaching a kid with a disability. Um, uh, so 
you know, just kind of seeing, you know, what kind of vehicle do they currently have? What are we looking at as far as modifications? If they already have maybe a minivan with an electronic deployable ramp or something like that, what are we starting with, you know? Um, and, and also, like, where's the student at? Have they taken driver's ed? Do they have a permit? I will say to that point, um, it's really helpful if the student um, already has some knowledge base of rules of the road and has some idea of what they're going to be doing driving. Otherwise, it's hard all the time for me to assess, well, is this like new driver or is this because of their brain injury? You know, so it's helpful to know if they if they have been um, studying for the test or already have their permit, um, that's kind of a gray area because sometimes to get their permit, they we need to also say what um, modifications they need. So it's, it's a little bit tricky, but hopefully there's a little bit of knowledge about rules of the road. And then I would also say that we know with our kids with disabilities, it's really important that it's their decision to drive. Um, sometimes it's the parents um, that are saying, listen, we got to start being an adult here. And, and, you know, when you're 18, I want you to be independent, more independent or something like that. And the student is really nervous about it. Um, or sometimes um, they just think, well, this is what I do because I'm 16 and all my friends are doing it, right? So it's really important, I think, I think to identify the goals of the student. I had a, a client with ADHD and he like, and then uh, was on the autism spectrum and just didn't care about driving, but his mom was pushing him. And guess what? We never made it because until two years later, because he just didn't see the need. He was getting around fine on the bus and he didn't want to drive. So that's really important to identify, I think. Um, so as part of my clinical assessment, um, I'm looking at physical abilities, visual abilities, cognition, reaction time. So I'm going to go through those really quick. Um, with our physical disabilities, I mean, I think this is like, I feel like maybe the easiest situation um, for a student to be able to drive. Because with physical disabilities, basically, if they want to drive, we can probably modify a vehicle. We could probably get them to drive if the only issue is a physical disability. And I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more. But I'm assessing that client's like neck range of motion, their upper and lower extremity function. Okay, can they like reach? Do they have the muscle strength? Um, I have a client right now who can reach to here, and that's it. And his hands are deformed. Um, and he can't you know, he can't, he does not have the strength to do a full range of motion on the wheel, right? Can he feel, can he grasp the wheel? Do we need to modify in some way? Lower extremity function seems pretty basic. Do they have the motor control, the strength to reach the pedals? But also, um, are they using a brace? Um, do they have an amputation? You know, um, do they have a prosthetic that they could drive with? Um, that's legal, by the way, they can drive with their, pro some can drive with their prosthetics. Um, uh, do they know where their foot is in space? That's something called proprioception. So right now I know like my knee is bent and, and maybe my toes are pointed down without looking at, at my feet. But some of our kids don't have that ability. That's called proprioception. And so you could understand that they could easily miss a gas pedal or a brake pedal, right? Like those are the kids that are maybe like overshooting or undershooting or getting their foot stuck under the pedals. Hopefully you're not in the car with them at that point. But that's a situation where um, maybe the lower extremities aren't an option for driving and the obvious is you know maybe the patient is non-ambulatory at all they don't walk at all and they're wheelchair bound they use a power wheelchair or a manual wheelchair so then we're going to look into modifications um, along with that their balance transfers you know what i mean transfers is like going from one surface to the other so how well can they get from their wheelchair into the vehicle a lot of our kids are getting in and out of the passenger seat um, on their own. Some kids don't. Some kids drive up the ramp and sit as a as a dependent passenger and they stay in their wheelchair. Um, fall risk, things like that. So moving on to vision, um, we know visual acuity, that's what you get tested at at the, at the driver's license division, right? You look through, can you read these lines? Oh, good, your vision's great. Well, has anybody noticed that this client can't see this right periphery at all because they've had a stroke when they were an infant and they have um, a field cut on one side or the other. And sometimes it can happen in both. So that's really important. Also, um, some of our patients just have poor visual attention. Um, they have trouble uh, even co with visual coordination. So saccades, pursuits, anyway, that's um, the important thing about vision. Um, sometimes you'll notice these kids, like their eyes um, kind of uh, beat a little bit when you're looking into their eyes. So there's, there's a couple assessments for that. Then we move on to cognition. Um, I don't, I, in another presentation, I gave a, a 
instructor said that he had somebody that just couldn't remember five minutes after he told her and she had had a brain injury and um, had really poor short term memory loss so um, the cognitive piece, it can be really tricky, we have a lot of kids with ADHD. Um, uh, maybe on the autism spectrum um, or who have suffered some sort of um, injury uh, either you know at birth or or as they were becoming of driving age um, and then some of our kids um, are maybe developmentally delayed right we just have um, developmental delay and so maybe that student isn't really appropriate to start driving at 16 right so um, I think when it comes to cognition um, I you know I was just going to say that, hello, yeah, um, when it comes to cognition, I think it's really important to get involved with um, the, uh, the team if there is a, an IEP for the, the student or a 504 or something and, and getting to know like what are the, um, the recommendations for that student. Oftentimes those students need more help, more practice, more drive time with their parents. Um, it doesn't always mean they're not a candidate for driving. Yeah. Oh, uh-huh. To you or to the state? That's a great question. So um, if it were me, there's, if it were me, I would say yes. The reason is, is because if that student starts driving and on the application to get your license, there's questions about that. You know, are you visually impaired? Have you had a neurologic injury? Do you have a heart condition? And if hopefully one of those would be appropriate and the first time they're getting their license, let's say it happened at birth or something. Um, and they are blind in one eye or something um, they should dis disclose that and then what happens is they just get a form from the driver's license division and they have their ophthalmologist sign that form and then they get a license, you know, sometimes if depending on how the ophthalmologist fills out that form they can put restrictions on that student so maybe no nighttime driving things like that i think it's important because legally let's say that student was in an accident let's say i rear-ended that student okay my fault totally my fault but i'm having a bad day i get my attorney involved right and my attorney is like whoa well guess what i found out about lisa she is blind in one eye so you know what let's go after her because she didn't go through the proper channels to disclose that information and so i'm going to turn it around and sue her for even being on the road so i encourage students to yes disclose their when i say health information they're giving the driver's license division the bare minimum we're trying to protect their health information um, they don't have to say that they had a brain injury but they might say i had a neurologic event but my doctor says i'm good to go and so i'm going to move on it's just one form especially for most kids um, they'll have to do it one time and then that's it okay for our other students that maybe have had a brain injury or a stroke or something like that um, those students would have to do it for it depends on how the doctor fills out the form sometimes it's once a year sometimes it's every two years however the doctor sees fit um, but after five years it's kind of like okay you've been driving for five years we don't need to know about it anymore okay does that answer your question great um okay so um what i was going to say is you know these are the three main systems we use for driving right and all of those equal and add up to reaction time if you ask me okay a lot of us think about react well i'm going to talk about reaction time in a second so i won't go there oh yes i will okay here it is so a lot of us think about reaction time as like dog run in front of your car how fast can you move your foot from gas to brake that's super important right if the patient can't feel their leg or they can't move their prosthetic in a timely manner or can't feel where the pedals are obviously that reaction time is not going to work right but think about um uh, let's say the student's doing fine on the regular pedals um but they have a hard time with divided attention they can't keep track of something and do something else we all know that's called multitasking right dividing your attention um having a working memory of like what just happened i just passed a biker and now i'm checking my speed and i see this and i'm going to turn in the grocery store but they forget about the biker to kind of check you know that's a problem right so a lot of times we start seeing um, some of those cognitive deficits really surface when we're doing um, things like left hand turns and uh, lane changes which are the most dangerous and require a lot of multitasking um, and so i'm using multitasking as kind of a 
just kind of a garbage can term, but basically this is one of the tools that I use to assess reaction time, one of them. Um, this is a, a machine called the DynaVision. Oh. And um, basically if the red light lights up, um, so the guy's like turning his head and eyes, looking all around the screen. When the red light lights up, he hits it, right? So he keeps going as fast as he can, okay? Well, then in that blue box, the next test is in the blue box, numbers will pop up. And the, the student would have to say five, two, eight as they're pushing the red buttons, okay? So there's been some research about this device and safe driving. And um, some of my kids with maybe on the autism spectrum, they like kill this, they knock it out of the park, right? Um, but then maybe when we're doing the second test, it gets a little bit harder because that divided attention. Um, so then the next, uh, basically the same company invented this uh, to more of a touch screen. It's basically the same thing. Um, you can do all, you can just do more programs on, on the new and improved version. Um, we can put it at the, at the student's eye level. We can do rotator. We can decide, can they decipher between blue and red and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, do they get dizzy when they're turning their heads? That sort of thing. So I have that um, machine too, um, which is helpful. And then finally, um, another thing I use besides, you know, besides all the things we talked about, right? I'm, I'm physically like taking note of what's going on, visual system, cognitive system, because sometimes reaction time really has to do with processing speed or, or divided attention or memory, right? So all these different cognitive components. Um, so we also have this driving simulator, which I mentioned earlier. Um, it's a drive safety. Um, it's supposed, it, it's supposed to really mimic the road and also not make people dizzy and car sick. <laughs> um, that's pretty important. Um, it's fairly basic. It, it has um, the standard pedals on it. And then also you can't see it in that photo, but a left foot accelerator, um, which I also have in my vehicle, my adapted vehicle. Um, so I use this as a tool. Um, it has a lot of different programs I can use for assessing one being gas to brake. They got to hold the gas pedal just at the sweet spot to get the green light on. As soon as they see a red light, bam, they hit the brake. Okay, maybe we try that with the right foot, it's not working. Maybe we try it with the left foot and it's working pretty good, okay? So that I use that for a, a reaction time test. And then um, there's another a couple programs where you can have things pop up in their mirrors and they have to indicate on the steering wheel that with these little buttons, if they see this E pop up and then read out the number on the mirror. I mean, it can get really complicated if we need it, um, which is helpful um, for, for some of our students. Obviously we can, um, have a patient in a wheelchair um, we can modify the steering wheel and we can also put hand controls on this simulator which is super helpful if you've never driven with hand controls and or if you've never driven period um, so we can get you used to how it all works um, on that vein i just wanted to make note that a lot of our kids especially with physical disabilities so you think of your kids um, that have maybe spina bifida uh, cp uh, muscular dystrophy those kids have not had the opportunity that other able-bodied kids have had, right? So they haven't been able to get in the golf cart and drive or the side-by-side -side or um, even on a four-wheeler. Um, some of them haven't done that, right? Um, they didn't get in those little power wheels when they were kids to kind of get the idea. Maybe they don't sit on their parents' lap and like kind of steer or whatever, you know? They just don't have the same opportunities um, in their development as they go along. So oftentimes those kids that are now gonna maybe use hand controls to drive, maybe they just need a little more practice because they're not used to coordinating like this hand doing something, this hand doing something and looking all around, right? Um, so sometimes it's not really an impairment as much as uh, practice, right? And so I, I just wanna make that note because I feel like some kids get written off really fast because they're not picking up the way that other kids do. But you have to keep in mind, those kids have no driving experience, right? So give them a little bit more time. Maybe they get a few more hours. Maybe, maybe you're saying, look, you need 80 hours with your parents instead of 40, right? Um, or you need more hours with an instructor and they need to pay for that um, privately or however you wanna, wanna recommend. Or I don't know if you guys do, do you guys do extra training hours with kids? No, I'm sure you don't have time, I wouldn't think, but, um, but some of our kids really need it. And some of our kids, 
will need a passenger break <laughs> for some training hours. So um, anyways, uh, moving on, I'm just going to talk about um, after I do my clinical assessment, um, then I'm, I'm moving on to a behind the wheel assessment. Now, I just want to say I don't put every kid behind the wheel. Um, it really depends on what I've seen in the clinic. Sometimes we just do a simulator evaluation. Um, with my kids with uh, physical disabilities, if I'm talking to the family about how to modify a vehicle, I oftentimes will try to get them in a, vehicle, a modified vehicle, in our vehicle. And so we go to a closed range, um, and then we have Sugar House Park that's also really helpful, and a neighborhood right there. So depending on the student, um, but I do have the vehicle has a, obviously a passenger braking system like yours um, and inside it has um, a left foot accelerator. Can you guys hear me? Am I okay? A left foot accelerator that um, I hope they can hear me on zoom um, has a left foot accelerator that's electronic so I can push a button. It starts the left foot accelerator, the right foot accelerator turns off um, and then I can install hand controls. Um, I have uh, three different sets, two that can be mounted on the left and one that can be mounted on the right. And in June, we're getting a new vehicle with six different options for hand controls, which will be really sweet. So um, just to allow uh, more options for kids. Um, okay, so before I go into hand controls and that sort of thing, I just wanted to mention that Really, with physical disabilities, if there's a desire to drive, there's probably a way to do it. Um, and, you know, the, the cost of the vehicle is sometimes outrageous, depending on what the student might need. Um, so we always talk about starting with the least amount of modifications. But the thing I think I want to impress on you guys is with your students with disabilities, one of the everybody talks about like driving right but our stu these students really need the first step they really need is to be able to access their vehicle enter and exit safely and independently um, before we even talk about driving what vehicle are they going to use is that the most appropriate vehicle does it fit them correctly and safely um, and can they get into the driver's seat in the driver's compartment? Okay, so sometimes that looks like the minivan with the, the fold out ramp that we've seen and, a, and a, a kid either pushing up with a manual wheelchair or with their power chair and they're going to drive right from their chair right from the driver's seat. Okay, sometimes that's great. Sometimes they um, get a, a seat inside the vehicle, this one, that turns so they can drive into their vehicle. They can lock down their chair that they have automatic locking systems or or manual locking systems and the seat turns around and they bought they um, pop over to the driver's seat so the seat spins it's called six-way seat sometimes we need a valet seat that comes out and down and so the student can transfer up and then the seat like raises up and goes back in like that that gentleman in the truck this lady here is doing it from the passenger seat so there's all sorts of vehicles out there to make it work um, it used to be you had to have a minivan. <laughs> People don't like that very much. So nowadays we have all sorts of SUVs. This is a Kia uh, Soul. Um, all sorts of SUV and, and different modifications. Some of these smaller SUVs, they, they have a rear entry versus a side entry. There's pros and cons. Um, this, this vehicle here, uh, my patient owns and the whole floor pan and the whole um, driver's side door comes out all in one piece, lowers down. He doesn't have use of his hands. He backs in on with his man. He uses a manual wheelchair, backs in, and it locks him in. And the whole thing raises up, slides back into the driver's compartment, and he drives with hand controls. So there are so many different vehicles out there and options. Obviously, they're spendy, right? Depending on what you what you do. Um, this is a really common one to transfer to this transfer seat here. Hook your uh, chair to the outrigger and then the outrigger puts your wheelchair in the bed of your truck. Um, and oftentimes those have an automatic topper too. Um, have you guys seen some of these vehicles before that are modified? Okay, so they're out there. If there's enough will and desire and money to drive, um, it can be done. 
what I want to say about that too is there are funding sources for these vehicles, especially um, for our students that are maybe graduating, getting to be like 18, and they need to um, be able to be independent to, to go to school, to work, whatever. So vocational rehab is, is a funding source, and also the uh, Utah Independent Living Center um, often pays for vehicles. So to that point, they don't pay for the vehicle. You have to have the chassis, but they will pay for the modifications to be done. Okay. I mean, sometimes we're looking at thousands, right? And so it's important that we decide which vehicle um, early on before we talk about modifications. Okay, so from that, most of the students you guys are going to see are going to be using what I consider kind of a low tech driving option, which is basic hand controls. Who has experience with hand controls? Sweet. Okay. Um, how many students have you been with? Just one. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit? Was the hand control on the left? Okay. Um, and then it was it. Sorry, what district are you in? Okay. Nice. Okay. Did the, and the district brought in a car? Or do you guys have your own car? Yeah. 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 Totally. Um, I think just so you know, um, if a student needs hand controls the vehicles are available or the or the district has to make them available. I think up in the Salt Lake Valley, I, I want to say there's five or six vehicles that they kind of all swap between districts and whatnot. Most of the vehicles you're going to see um, are similar to this um, style. This is called a push rock hand control or this one's called a right angle. So if you have a hand control in your left hand, typically or is your left mounted? Did I already ask? Sorry. Um, it's usually left mounted. Anybody know why? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are right dominant, so it's nice to have your dominant hand on the steering wheel. But left mounted, if you put it on the right side, guess what? It gets in the way of the gears. You know, if you're, you're shifting your gear here, here, on the dash, whatever. So the hand control sometimes isn't as convenient. So left mounted is probably the most common style. It's probably what you guys will see and work with. I don't know of any um, state cars that have a right mounted. Um, but sometimes we do right mounted for different reasons, right? If, if the kid's left arm uh, isn't as strong maybe uh, to use the hand control on that side, and, but it can, um, uh, work for steering will mix it up and whatever so um, but anyways the hand control it's push down for gas and forward for brake it's all in one hand um, the hand control that's a push rock is pull towards you push forward for brake how safe did you feel with the hand control did you use it did you try it out good yeah yeah totally I think it's harder like it's harder if you know how to drive with pedals, right? And so a lot of my clients that have driven and now have a brain injury or something, it's hard for them, or a spinal cord injury, it's sometimes hard for them to adapt. But our kids with disabilities, a lot of them aren't used, I mean, they've never driven before. So this is natural, right? Or they don't use their legs in general. And so they would never want to reach for the pedals, you know? Um, so I think that's an important point because when you're training a student, Oftentimes it's the parent or the instructor that's kind of more freaked out by the equipment than the student and it's actually kind of a normal learning curve for the student and they pick up on it really fast. It's just that the parents like, oh gosh, I don't know. I don't know because they've only learned with their feet. Right. So I always encourage people take yourself on your your driving range and try out the hand controls because it actually is really um, fairly simple. Um, and I always tell people if your legs move, um, uh, sit in the frog leg position, put your legs cross legged and scoot them all the way back, like as far under your butt as you can. So you're not tempted to reach for the, the pedals. Um, but hand controls are extremely safe. OK if you have them installed professionally. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you know, but you can buy hand controls on Amazon. I probably shouldn't tell you that, but you can. Um, they're like 250 bucks, okay? It's super cheap. Um, you strap them kind of to the pedals and you strap um, the main part to the steering column often. Um, there's several different kinds. We call those portable hand controls. I'm just gonna say, don't do it. It's not worth it. Save those type of hand controls for your side by side or whatever, an off road vehicle. In a new vehicle with a new driver, we want the safest possible option. <laughs> and um, 
I've had I've had lots of different uh, patients over the years buy portable hand controls and just start driving on their own, and they always regret it, or they always say, "I just decided I don't feel safe, and so I need to get the real deal." And I'm like, "Good idea." So there's four different vendors in Salt Lake that'll mod, or there's one in Utah County, three in Salt Lake County um, that modify vehicles. And the golden question is always, "Well, how much do they cost? How much does like a basic set of hand controls? Let's say your student has spina bifida." They're, they're perfectly fine cognitively, visually. Um, they're super you know, smart. They're, they want to drive. They just need the hand controls. They can't use their legs. That is typically, just to throw out a ballpark, 1500 bucks. Okay? It's, um, what, it's a lot cheaper than an accident, right? So, or your hand control falling into your lap, which I've seen before. So left mounted hand controls, usually kind of towards you or down for gas, forward for brake. Okay, anybody know why? It's natural. That's, that's what we do when we're scared. We put our, our ex, we go into extension reflex. Um, these are up at the top are examples of right mounted hand controls and floor mounted hand controls. These other ones will be mounted to the steering column. And then now, I mean, it used to be, I don't know what your vehicle had. It used to be two posts going to the gas and the brake. I don't know if you could see that in that other picture in our vehicle. Um, it used to be two posts, mechanical, oh, you can't see it in the picture. It's really hard to get pictures in cars, but um, you would operate the, the gas and the brake just with these two posts and mechanically um, work the hand controls. And really now um, it's all about the electronics in the, in the vehicle. So now typically you'll still have a mechanical post going to the brake because we don't want that to fail, right? We don't want to do that electronically, at least not yet, it's coming. Um, and then they go through the wiring system, um, through the steering column, and put that inside the hand control. The benefit of that is it turns off the gas pedal, okay? So I push a button, hand controls, don't push the button, I can use regular pedals. Everybody always asks me, as a parent, can I still drive the car? Yes, you don't have to do anything different, you just don't push the button to use the hand control. Okay, so the parents can get in and still drive the car after it's um, had hand controls installed. Um, everything's the same. They just ignore the little handle on the left side. That's the only difference, okay? Um, any questions about hand controls? We're gonna keep talking about them a little bit, but um, so if your student has one hand here, they don't have two hands on the wheel, which is what we preach, right? So what do they do? What did your student do? Palmed it? Yeah, yeah, totally. That's, that's perfectly fine, depending on the situation. Um, oftentimes, if they have their hand on the hand control, we probably want a spinner knob, which maybe you've heard, they're illegal, <laughs> okay? Spinner knobs are illegal. Hand controls are illegal, unless there's a medical reason. Same doctor form. When the, when the doctor fills out that form, he's gonna put that that patient had a neurologic injury or an, has a neurologic uh, deficit. They put hand controls, spinner knob, turn signal extension, perfectly legal once we have a doctor sign that form, okay? Let's say you get in an accident with this equipment and you don't have that form, that's not a good thing, okay? You could get sued, you could get a ticket or whatever. So if that form is signed on the back of the student's license, just like it says corrective lenses, it would say hand controls and a spinner knob or turn, and a turn signal extension, any equipment, that's not OEM. We have to have a doctor's signature. If we're using a left foot accelerator, we need a doctor's signature, okay? So typically a, a traditional spinner knob is just this, right? Um, but there's all sorts of steering aids that we can use. Um, our, our amputees uh, that are driving with a hook use an amputee ring that they hook um, their hook into. Um, our clients that don't have use of their fingers, they can't grip, but they have almost full function of their arms. They set their hand in this tri pin and they use their arm to drive. They're not gripping with the steering wheel, okay? And we could do that on the hand control as well. So lots of different options for steering um, that are available, but you need to have uh, the DMV form filled out, which I'll show you. Um, on that same vein, hand control on this hand, steering wheel, steering knob on this hand, how do I get to my blinker? Some people just let go, right? They let go of the hand control and they'll use the blinker. It's just like letting your foot off the gas, right? Um, they'll 
put the blinker up and down. Sometimes, depending on the vehicle, we need a little extension so that because the blinker's up here, the hand controls here, and the kid's hands like this big, right? They can't reach with their fingers, maybe. So we put a little extension on there. Or um, on the steering wheel, maybe here's the blinker. We put in a, a bar across toward their spinner knob, and they just hit the the blinker there. Okay. We have fancy things too that go through the wiring of the car where you can put your brights, your um, blinkers, your windshield washing fluid and, and wipers um, on the spinner knob as well. That thing's attached to the wheel. Okay, so that's super fancy and nice. Um, this one's a, a little bit maybe of a lower tech one where we can program um, four different buttons uh, there, six different buttons, sorry. Um, so there's lots of different options for um, blinkers. Most of the time, our kids might just need a simple extension that bolts onto the turn signal. Okay, it's pretty easy, not expensive, um, but it helps them get to their blinker better when they have two hands um, separated. Um, this, is, by the way, is just like a smaller radius for um, a steering wheel, a smaller wheel. Sometimes our kids need that. And then also, when it comes to steering, sometimes their kids don't have the strength or the range of motion. So there's options for that called low effort steering where we take out um, the the whole steering system and we revamp it so it's much easier to drive have you been in a car that's hard you know more more resistance when you when you drive it versus like a fancy new 2022 toyota sienna those things are super easy to drive uh, or super easy to turn the wheel with very little resistance so sometimes we're recommending a whole different vehicle or we're recommending a whole different um we're, we're recommending reduced effort or low effort steering. That's expensive. Those are expensive things to modify, um, but it can be done. Uh, so those are kind of like higher tech um, options. Um, <laughs> this is an example here, left foot accelerator. Anybody used one before? This is the mechanical one. It can just be bolted into your car. Again, the district I think has a couple of these. Um, bolted in, it covers the right pedal you use the left pedal, but the right pedal still moves mechanically. Okay. Then we have an electric or electronic um, left foot accelerator as well, which is what my vehicle has. I push a button, the left foot accelerator turns on, the right foot accelerator is disengaged. Okay. Or you don't push the button and you just can use the right pedal. So some of our students, that's an option too. If their right leg is the leg impaired and they have a perfectly good left leg. Um, there's a debate on whether or not a left foot accelerator is more appropriate versus a hand control. It kind of depends on the student, the situation, um, because ha has anybody had a student like just reach over? Do you know if that's allowed? If their right leg doesn't work, can they use their left leg to reach over? Is that legal? No. Has anybody broken their right leg or their ankle before? Been in a cast? Yeah. What do people do? They Maybe. drive with their left foot. It is legal. It's totally legal. Is it the best option? Maybe not. It's pretty uncomfortable. Um, so if this is going to be a long term thing, sometimes I say it's a new student, they're learning to drive, put the left foot accelerator in because otherwise they're going to have to learn this way. And then at some point in their life, their back's going to be messed up and they're going to have to learn this way, right? So, um, but it's not illegal. It's not illegal to drive that way. Okay, if I just wanted to click on this link, hopefully it'll open um, to show you this form. Anybody seen it before? This is um, called an FAE, a Functional Ability Evaluation um, Medical Report. You can see here, there's all sorts of medical reasons that people might be impaired when they drive, okay? My, the other part of my job, when, I'm not, when I don't see kids, I see all sorts of adults, even adults that have maybe a diagnosis of a memory problem, right? And I'm evaluating, are they still safe and capable of driving? Because they have a uh, diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that. That's really fun. Um, and then I get to talk to them about retiring from driving sometimes. So, um, so that column maybe is more appropriate. And even this column could be appropriate for some of our kids that um, have had some sort of developmental delay as well. Um, mental health. Um, a sleep disorder. A lot of our kids, the kids you'll be seeing probably a uh, neurologic disorder or maybe a seizure. So this is the form that needs to be filled out. And I learned this, that you guys as instructors, um, it's always been said that you can't use a spinner knob. They're illegal. 
when you're even if you've used hand controls before that is not true the student needs to have i've had a, a ton of different students lately they just need to have this form filled out and then you on your vehicles can put a spinner knob on there okay so some of our kids maybe their legs are perfectly fine but they only have one arm right they they're probably safer with a spinner knob and maybe even a turn signal extension or something yeah did you have a question no oh, just stretching okay so this form is super important important the other thing is um, when i was talking about restrictions for driving and maybe a visual problem or even our kids that um, are learning to drive and we want to give them maybe extra practice close area familiar places they're not ready to drive at nighttime they're not ready to drive on the freeway we put we can put restrictions on right sorry the clicker in here was stolen so i'm just kind of pointing but this area here um we can restrict students and we can i mean we can check these boxes or we can say whatever we want you know if the area restriction five miles from home 10 miles from home 50 miles from home what 50 miles from home but you have to stay 40 miles or an, an hour or less meaning no freeway driving right I've seen that before that that a physician has done so oftentimes i'm recommending restrictions based on my evaluation. Um, to the physicians, because they don't know and and they don't really want to say because they've never been in a car with a student or whatever so sometimes. Um, that can be an issue, but having this form completed um, will help you guys get the appropriate equipment in the car um, to train the student as well okay. Um, and I, I just want to say, oh, this is how they fill it out. So I just wanted to say also, um, I think a lot of people are hesitant maybe about these modifications, or maybe they feel like they're not safe. Um, trust me, there are conferences upon conferences upon conferences about hand controls, high tech driving equipment, drivers that drive with a straw and they sip and they puff and they turn. Drivers that drive with a joystick. Guys, it's out there, we do it, people drive that way. And it's safe, believe it or not. Um, we have very few crashes with driving modifications with something like a hand control or something like that. So um, hopefully you're not scared of it. Um, because of course, as you know, as an instructor, if you have a lot of anxiety about it, the student definitely will, right? Um, but I'm hoping that I can catch some of these kids and educate them and their parents on the most appropriate modification for their vehicle so that because the timing is super important right they need to be driving with their family and getting those on road hours so that you guys can drive with them too so having that work together and and saying let we need a modified vehicle so this student can progress through driver's education it's really important the timing of that's super important so okay i'm going to stop and ask if you have any questions yeah <laughs> both based on their responses the oh whoops i shouldn't have done that based on their responses um the dld will give them that form when they go to take their written test um but also um sometimes i've had a lot of students that have taken the test maybe they didn't fill out the form correctly or they didn't think i had this girl the other day she's miss missing like this much of her left visual field from a stroke that happened four years ago but it's still significant and um she still needs some modifications and some um training and you know she went and got her permit and didn't disclose that because she can read what's right here you know her acuity um she uses contact lenses there's nothing wrong with how far she could see away it's that her visual field is missing so she didn't put it on the form and i'm like listen you know luckily that in that case i i saw her and you know helped her through that but um oftentimes if i'm seeing the student i'm giving them the form too i'm sending it to the physician to the primary care or maybe their their pediatrician a lot of these kids they go to spine spina bifida clinic um at the u or primary children's you know 
so a lot of the kids with um, severe disabilities, they're already plugged in to somebody that's going to, that knows that this is coming and things like that. So they're already being referred. The spina bifida clinic at Primary Children's, I mean, it's a steady stream. They turn 15 and they are in my office, you know, and they just have it set up as part of their program um, to help the kids be a little bit more independent. So that's super helpful, but so obviously not every kid's going there either. So, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I, I still feel mixed about it. I think the research is still mixed about um, technology in the vehicles that is becoming super helpful. Um, there's a lot of research with ADHD and having those um, safety uh, features in a vehicle and that they can be helpful for those students. Um, so I'm a little bit mixed about them because I still feel like it's super important to be able to check your blind spot, to do a head check. You know, I don't think anybody wants to give that up, right? And so, I mean, I feel, I feel mixed about the safety features, but oftentimes, depending on the diagnosis, I think it's helpful. For our students in wheelchairs, having a backup camera is super helpful, you know, um, because some of them are driving big vans, you know, when that, when that gate goes up, when their lift or their ramp, sorry, goes up, if they're a rear entry ramp, they can't see in their rear view mirror, you know? So they all, they have their side mirrors and that's it. I mean, how great that we can have cameras on vehicles now, right? So it, it depends. I'm not ready to like say, oh good, that's, you know, you have that fancy BMW that vibrates your left butt cheek when somebody's in your blind spot. I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready to say that, but yeah. Any other questions? I do, yeah. The VA, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. The VA has its own driving program. Um, veterans are allowed to choose that or go wherever they want. So I do see a lot of veterans. Um, and, and they, you know, luckily the VA, if they, they'll pay for my evaluation and it'll pay for modifications and sometimes even a vehicle. So they're a great funding source. <laughs> but they do have their own um, driving program. And they have a new therapist there. The old therapist um, was 80, and he would sometimes see the same clients, and they could never get past him. <laughs> and so, and anyways, but yeah, so I do see clients from the VA, but they also have their own program. And other than that, IHC used to have a driving program. They did not have their own vehicle um, that was adapted, so they would partner with like A1, and the therapist would sit in the back seat, the driving instructor would sit in the front seat. And they were just limited on the types of um, modifications they had because they were um, using A1's vehicle. So, and actually, as of four months ago, they suspended their driving program completely. So IHC doesn't have anything anymore, which is really unfortunate, actually. Um, hopefully, I don't know what the status is, if they're going to get that up and running. But IHC had a program, a drive program, and then, and then I did, uh, or we do at the U, and then the VA. And that's pretty much it in the Valley. Um, or really in the state, actually. So, yeah, not many resources. Some some kids, like in St. George, have gone to Las Vegas to be evaluated, especially for higher tech needs and things like that. Any other questions? Okay, well, hopefully, um, I'll just go back to that screen. But basically, if, if you think your student um, would is appropriate for a referral, um, for me, I mean, it's a pretty simple, I don't need a physician referral or anything like that. They can self-refer. A lot of times um, through the school district, they're getting a referral through the school, school district. We have a website. I have cards up here. Audra also, sometimes if, if it comes up the channel, she'll forward the, student, um, the student's name for, to me or something like that. Um, but she, and she obviously knows how to get a hold of me so she can send you my direction if you need me. But yeah, so thanks for listening. And if you want a flyer or a business card or whatever, it's right up here. Okay, thank you.